Welcome everyone to the thrilling episode of OPG Live that we have planned today. I'm pretty sure that this is going to be the best episode we've ever done. Of course, I say that every episode that we have. So one of these days, it's actually going to be true. I'm professional <laughs> photographer Ian Plant. And I'm Lilia Khalif. And we are here to present some interesting photo techniques to you today. Uh, before we start, uh, Lily has got an announcement about our sponsor, Tamron, who I guess is running a sweepstakes. Yes. So yes, I wanted to let you know about the Tamron sweepstakes we currently have running. The sweepstakes actually ends tomorrow, so make sure you get in and enter before then. But you can win one of three lenses. If you win, you get to choose which lens you want, and you can enter by either clicking the banner below the chat box here, or if you're watching us on Facebook, the link is in the description. So make sure you enter by tomorrow, May 15th. That's when it ends. But till then, you still have time to enter, so make sure to get your email address in and get a chance to win a free lens. Now, I've actually had the opportunity to use two out of these three lenses, the 100 to 400 and the 70 to 210, which are really great focal lengths, especially if you're doing a lot of wildlife photography. The third lens, the 17 to 35, I haven't used the newer version. I used a very, very old version of that lens many years ago. So that lens has been updated with the new version, though I don't know much about it. But the other two lenses are really great lenses, and they're uh, they definitely give you a lot of bang for your buck, especially if you win them for free in a sweepstakes. Yes. Then that's a really great value proposition for you. <laughs> so in today's episode of OPG Live, I am going to talk about some of my favorite techniques for making wildlife photos. And part of the reason I'm talking about that is because wildlife photography is a lot of fun. Uh, typically, we end up doing a lot more of an emphasis on landscape photography in this show. So I thought it'd be a nice change of pace to change the focus and talk about this other uh, form of photography that I really love. Also, the reason why I'm talking about wildlife photography is I haven't been anyplace exciting in the past month since uh, we last saw you. I've been uh, stuck here at home in Minneapolis, so I haven't had a chance to get out and do any photography. So we're going to show some of my favorite wildlife photos that I've taken throughout the years. My travel schedule begins to pick back up again uh, actually uh, next week. And in the coming months, I'll have some exciting adventures in late June and early July. I'm going to be down in Argentina to photograph the total solar eclipse that's happening there. Ooh. And in August, I'll be in Greenland. Those will be landscape places. So I'll have lots of exciting photos and stories when I get back from both of those places. But for now, we're going to talk about wildlife photography, some of my favorite techniques for making compelling and dramatic wildlife photos. As always, we'll be taking questions live from you, the viewer, during this event. And if questions come in that are relevant to what I'm talking about, uh, Lilia will interrupt and we'll go ahead and answer them. Uh, if not, we'll answer the questions that have come in in the second half of the program. So I guess without further ado, I'm going to go in and start showing you some of my favorite wildlife photos. Now, when I'm making wildlife photos, I'm not just content to capture a documentary record of what I see with my eyes. Instead, I'm looking to create more of an artistic, abstract look for my photos, to take it up to the next level and to inject a bit of my personal artistic vision. And one thing I love to do when I'm making wildlife photos is to work in really dramatic light. Sunrise and sunset lighting that's really powerful and warm is a great thing to photograph. But usually, I'm not too interested in getting front lighting, having the light behind me. Instead, I like to work with directional angled light and backlighting, I find that these lend themselves to creating very powerful, very dramatic, and very artistic wildlife photos. So for example, with this photo of a fe female lioness stalking uh, for prey in Itosha National Park in Namibia, I was working with very strong side lighting in the early morning hours. So this is that period of time, maybe 10, 15 minutes after the sun has risen. It was a very clear day, so the light was strong, very colorful. When the light's this low on the horizon, it takes on that golden color. And I, the, the color was just absolutely beautiful. It was lighting up all the grass on the plains. And because of the direction of the light, most of the line was in shadow. So I had to wait for a moment when she turned her head so that half of her face was in the sunlight. And this uh, side lighting that is combined with the darker shadow lighting on the rest of her body creates a, a really interesting abstract look. So it's a, it's a much more interesting way to capture wild, your wildlife subject when you're working with this directional lighting. 
Another example is some elephants. This is also from Etosha National Park in Namibia. In this case, I was working with backlighting at sunset. These three elephants were coming in from a water hole and they were kicking up a lot of dust in the dry desert plain there. And the dust was catching the sunlight that was filtering through. So it ends up, the dust ends up scattering the light and the dust looks like it's glowing from within with that beautiful golden sunset color. And the scattered light also is spread throughout the scene. So before we had more of a darker silhouette, uh, here, because the dust is scattering the light, you can see a lot of the detail in the elephants. They're not rendered in pure silhouette. And the result is just a very colorful scene that appears to be lit from within. And at this point, I think we're going to switch over to a video of one of my photo adventures in Kenya. This is part of a video course that's available to OPG members and available for purchase on the OPB, OPG store. I love shooting into the light and backlighting in particular where you have the sun behind your subject and it's lighting everything from behind can be very powerful and it's my favorite kind of light to work with when I'm doing wildlife photography. All right, we found some lions and we are going to try to put the sun behind the lions and take advantage of the backlighting. Even better, we've got lion cubs and they're playing on a termite mound. This could be awesome. This is a great morning. The sunlight is very strong, so the backlighting is going to be really nice. Right, right there, right there, right there, right there. This is, this is good, this is good. Ah, uh, this is beautiful. This is absolutely gorgeous backlighting. This is the best morning. Here comes the second one. Now they're playing in this gorgeous backlighting. Oh yeah, this is what I came here for. We're gonna try to keep the sun behind the lions as they're moving towards us, so that means we're gonna have to reposition every few minutes as they're moving along. This is a situation where a zoom lens comes in handy because the lions are continuously moving towards us and the ability to zoom in or out as necessary to get the composition I want is critical. This is gonna be non-stop shooting as the action goes. I've got a fast shutter speed, 1 400th of a second to capture the action. I think I'm gonna bump it up to 1 500th of a second. Now I've dropped my exposure compensation to uh, minus a third. I really quickly check, it looks good. I don't wanna overexpose any of my highlights. There we go. Give us a look. Wait for that moment when they make eye contact. This is really sweet. Wow, what an incredible shoot. We photographed these lion cubs in this beautiful golden backlit grass. I can't wait to see the photos. All right. That was exciting. Ooh, very exciting. <laughs> very adorable. Lots of little lion cubs. I made that video like, what, two years ago? And my video production skills have gotten a lot better <laughs> since then. <laughs> I think it looks still pretty good. Don't well, thank be too you. hard on yourself. Okay. Uh, as you could probably tell from the video, when I'm trying to work with directional light, when I'm working with backlighting, I'm always keeping the sun behind my subject. So a lot of wildlife photographers live by the maxim, keep the sun behind your back. But I'm doing the opposite. I'm the guy when a bunch of photographers are lined up to photograph an animal and they're photographing it backlit, I'm going around to the other side so that I can photograph the um, I'm sorry, the other photographers are, are photographing the animal front lit. I'm the guy going around to the other side getting in everyone's shot so I could photograph the <laughs> animal back lit. Uh, but backlighting can be really powerful. As you can see, you get that rim lighting around the edge of a translucent subject. So it's not going to work with, for example, a rock. But if you're photographing a lion or a bird, uh, you know, a polar bear, anything with fur that has a fair amount of translucence, it's going to pick up that light in the backlighting. It's going to look like it's glowing from within and the results can be very powerful. So here's another example of a brown bear uh, in Alaska. 
that was charging through the water. And I shot this backlit. Now, this wasn't at sunrise or sunset. This was more uh, during the day when the color of the light was white. Uh, but still, the effect can be very powerful. So here, it really wasn't the rim lighting around the fur that I was looking to capture backlit. It was the water droplets that were in the air. So this is, as I said earlier, this is a way, when you're working with backlighting, of rendering your subject a bit more abstractly, because often the subject will end up going into silhouette or partial silhouette. And as a result, uh, a lot of the detail of the subject is obscured. So you're really relying on that rim lighting effect to reveal the outline of the animal. And you're relying on that backlighting to give the final image a really nice artistic look. Here's another example where I was using backlighting. This time it wasn't on the animal. I was photographing this red holler monkey in Peru who was sleeping in what looks to me like a rather uncomfortable uh, position on this tree trunk. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, I really like the scene. What I did is I zoomed out a little bit so I could include some of the backlit leaves that were in the scene to frame the monkey and to add some compositional interest. So this is a technique I often use. Going a little bit wider, instead of going in really tight on the animal, showing a bit of the animal's surroundings. It can provide some context to help tell the story of the animal's life. And it can also make the composition more interesting and more sophisticated. So here's another example of this zooming out where instead of just going in tight and photographing the animal, I zoom out and add other compositional elements to provide some more context and make the composition more interesting. So this was a pair of elephants at a water hole in Itosha National Park in Namibia. And I made this photograph at twilight but the elephants are actually lit by some artificial floodlights that they have at the waterhole. So there's a mix of that artificial and that natural light, which gives the photograph some interesting color. But I zoomed out enough to include that one tree to the side as an additional compositional element to make the visual design more exciting. And here's uh, another example of working with backlighting and also working with reflections, which is something I really love to do when I have the opportunity to use a reflective surface when I'm photographing wildlife. Almost always that reflective surface is water. So these were three elephants that were walking by a water hole. As a matter of fact, we saw these same three elements Three elephants a few photos back, that picture of the backlit elephants with all the dust. Uh, these are the same elephants later on after they had a good drink. They started walking away from the water hole right as the sun was setting. So I chose an exposure here that just captured the highlights, make sure that the highlights weren't overexposed, but let everything else go into silhouette. And all I capture then is the color of the sky, which is reflected in the water, and the reflection of the elephants in the water. You can't actually see the elephants because they're lost into the background, that dark background. But because of the position I was standing relative to the reflective surface, uh, you can't see the elephants above the horizon and the top part of the photo, but because the water is viewing the elephants at a different angle than I was, you actually see them above the horizon. So there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance. One of the reasons I love working with reflections is that it has this tendency to alter the reality that's perceived by your eyes. So because your position relative to the reflective surface is different, what you see uh, before you and what the reflection sees are going to be slightly different and can lead to some really interesting results. Now, eye contact is a really great way of telling a story with wildlife photos. And this is an example of uh, a really great eye contact in a photo. This was a photograph I took in Rwanda trekking with mountain gorillas. And this uh, looks like maybe a baby uh, gorilla being carried by its mother. It's actually three baby gorillas that were wrestling. They were in this tangled mess and they just kept rolling around. So it was a very difficult shoot. It was a lot of fun to watch, but it was very difficult. I had to wait for a moment when some sort of coherence emerged from the chaos. So in this particular instant, there was the moment when one of the uh, infant gorillas looked right at me. At the same time, it had reached up with a stick of bamboo and put it in its mouth to eat it. So it really helped clarify the composition, simplify things. And it was a great moment having that eye contact. And you know, because there was some light on the eyes, the eyes were shining very brightly. You could see the color in the eyes. So that's another important thing when you're working with eye contact to make sure that the eyes are actually in the light 
and make sure when you're focusing for wildlife photos to focus on the eyes because as long as the eyes are in focus, you can have a successful shot. If the eyes are out of focus and something else is in focus, like the animal's nose or its ears, then uh, the viewers are, are really going to find that to be disconcerting. So as long as the eyes are in focus, you've got a chance of making a really compelling wildlife photo. Now, another thing I like to do with my wildlife photos is to provide some depth, to put something in between the lens and my wildlife subject. So that puts something in between the viewer and the wildlife subject. And this helps create the illusion of three dimensions of depth in your photograph. And it could also be useful to frame your wildlife subject and to make the composition more interesting. So for this photograph of a mountain gorilla, once again in Rwanda, I used a screen of leaves on a small plant to give that photo, give that, um, to add that depth to this photo and to create this wash of color that frames the gorilla. This was a difficult shoot because the gorilla was on the ground eating and there was a small bush on the ground about 10 feet away from the gorilla. And I was down uh, in the mud on, in my knees uh, photographing through a gap in the leaves. So the leaves were maybe just a few inches away from my lens because I was using a short telephoto lens uh, and I was shooting wide open and the leaves were so close, instead of seeing the leaves, they're instead rendered as this abstract wash of color, this blur of color around the gorilla. And it was difficult because the gorilla was moving and the bush was moving, swaying in the wind, and I was moving back and forth trying to keep that gap in the leaves uh, lined up with the eyes of the gorilla. So it was a very challenging shoot. Uh, while I was making the photographs, one of my trackers came over and said, no, 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 Mr. Ian, that's not a very good place to see the gorilla. Stand up, you can see it better. Uh, but I, there was a method to my madness, so I, I stayed down on my knees in the mud to get the shot. Now, I also like to incorporate artificial light into my wildlife photos. Uh, sometimes I'll use a little bit of fill flash at low power to gently illuminate my subject. Uh, sometimes I'll use a spotlight, depending on uh, conditions and my subjects and where I am. And this is a photograph I made while in Kenya on safari. And I used a spotlight for this photo, and I waited for the moment when the lion stood up and gave out a mighty roar. Well. Okay, it was a yawn. You got me. <laughs> uh, but a, a, a roar and a yawn look a lot alike. And so when I made this photo, I made this at twilight and I lowered my overall exposure. I used exposure compensation and dropped it down to minus two or minus three so that the sky ends up looking a bit darker and moodier than it looked to the eye. That helps pull out the color in the sky as well. And that ensured that the rest of the shadowed landscape would go completely into silhouette. So the only part that's revealed is that roaring, I mean yawning, lion, <laughs> Uh, that is illuminated by the spotlight. So uh, telling a story is, is very important. And we did talk about the importance of eye contact with telling a story. And one of the things that makes this photo of a female lion uh, so effective is the unusual eye contact. She's looking up. She looks like she's glaring. Um, I'm sure that the viewer gets the same feeling that I got when I took this photo is that that lion is looking right at me and thinking about dessert. Uh, the other thing that makes this photo interesting, the, the thing that really tells the story, I think it's the visual element that really brings the whole thing together, is the bright red blood on the, uh, the lion's mouth. And she was feeding on a wildebeest. It was a pretty gross thing to be photographing. Normally when the lions start feeding, I, I get out of there. I just don't want to see that. But I, uh, I decided I wanted to try to get a photo, a nice, close, tight portrait of just the lion's head when she looked up with all that bright red on her uh, face because I knew that that color was really going to stand out. It was really going to tell a story and it was just going to add this uh, interesting element of color to the overall composition. So I waited for the moment. Actually, it was really tricky because the line, there was two lionesses. And every now and then, one of them would look up and look at uh, the safari vehicle I was in. But they typically wouldn't look up for very long. They were more interested in eating. And every now and then, they would just kind of you know, give us a quick look to see what we were up to. And so I had a very, very short period of time to react when she looked up and I just happened to get my lens in position to snap the shot, to get a sharp shot while I had that perfect glaring look from the lioness.
We have one question in relation to these photos in yeah. general. Sure. So we don't have to go back to any. But, okay. Um, Dewaste Master, I don't know how to pronounce that. That's my best guess. Asked, how much Photoshopping or post processing do you use in most of these photos? So, the, uh, I would say that I am editing fairly lightly whenever I share my Photoshop processing with folks uh, during uh, camera club presentations or photo conferences. They're always a little surprised at how subtle my uh, Photoshop work really is. Is. I, I will do some selective darkening and brightening, uh, and I might try to bring out a, a certain visual detail just a little bit more to give it some more emphasis. Like, for example, with the photo of the lioness, the blood on the face, it was important for that red to stand out, so I would brighten that just a little bit and give it a little extra saturation just to make it the more prominent part of the composition that it needed to be. But generally, I'm not really doing much uh, photo processing. I, I tend to edit with a pretty light touch. And one thing I don't want to do is to untether the photograph from the reality that was captured by my camera. So that's always important to me. Now, I'm shooting with RAW, and if you're shooting with RAW, RAW is not intended to be a final product. So you do need to apply some editing in Lightroom or Adobe Photoshop or some other editing program to get the image to a final state. So there's a little bit of subject subjective wiggle room as you uh, play around with that. Uh, but by and large, I'm not looking to uh, depart from reality in any significant way. All right. So That's thank my you. Only Great question. question related to the photos so far. All right. Let's dive back into the wildlife photos. Now we've got a photo of a male orangutan in Indonesia on the island of Sumatra. This is the Sumatran orangutan, which is highly endangered. There's only about 12,000 Sumatran orangutans left in the wild. There's also the slightly more famous Bornean. Uh, orangutan, and there's more of those, but they're also endangered. And they're, of course, on the island of Borneo, which is part Indonesia, part Malaysia. Now, I've been trekking on uh, the, the island of Borneo, and I found it to be really unpleasant because of all the leeches. But uh, the, the high forest in Sumatra, a little higher elevation, a little different climate, uh, is mostly leech-free. So I found the experience looking for orangutans there to be much more pleasant. And this is a nice tight portrait. I. I got of this uh, beautiful male orangutan. The males stand about five feet tall and can weigh up to 200 pounds. So they're you know, roughly the size of a person, probably a little shorter than the average person, but they're heavier than the average person. And they're a lot stronger. They spend all of their life in the trees. So their arms are totally jacked. And I'm not kidding you when I say that they can literally rip you limb from limb. So it's a good thing that they're actually a very peaceful species. It's not like they're going out of their way looking to do that to people. Yeah. Uh, but if you do encounter an orangutan in the wild, it's probably a good idea not to say anything insulting, be polite. <laughs> and uh, make sure that you don't do anything that uh, ticks it off. But in any event, uh, I managed to get a pretty tight portrait of, of this particular animal. Now, usually I'm not looking to make tight portraits. Usually I'm looking for a wider uh, representation of the animal. But for this particular shot, it worked to have that tight telephoto portrait, and the eye contact was really important for the shot. But a lot of times, when I'm thinking about the eyes, I'm not looking to get that eye contact. I'm actually looking to use line of sight a bit more creatively. So this is another orangutan. This is a female orangutan. And in this particular shot, I went a bit wider to provide a little bit more context and to make the composition more exciting. I like the curving shape of the vine that she was swinging on. She was basically just swinging there for about 20 or 30 minutes like she was playing. And she was actually using it like a, like a child swing, uh, which was kind of fun to watch. Uh, but for this particular shot, as you can see when I zoom in, instead of going for eye contact, I waited for that moment when she was looking up. Sometimes a sidewards glance can tell a more interesting story than that eye contact. So line of sight creates a compositional line. The direction that an animal is looking creates this implied compositional line, so it can help be a part of an overall visual design that can be very exciting. So here, having her look up uh, just worked really well with the other shapes and lines in the composition. Now, uh, backlighting, as I said before, is one of my favorite things to photograph. And I'm always looking for opportunities to capture 
that rim lighting effect. And that rim lighting effect is strongest when you have really strong light. So you gotta be out there shooting when the sun isn't being blocked by trees or leaves or haze or clouds on the horizon in the sky. And for this shot of a polar bear from the Alaskan Arctic, uh, I had exactly that. It was sunset, the sun was relatively low in the sky, but there was nothing on the western horizon. It was very clear, so the light was extremely strong. So I chose an exposure where I was dropping my exposure considerably so that I was only recording detail in those bright highlight areas, letting everything else in the scene fall into silhouette. And that allowed me to capture just the rim light outline of the animal, letting everything else go dark. It's a very abstract artistic expression of this particular animal, but one that I think is very powerful. So this is something I'm always on the lookout for, but it only works when the light is super, super strong. I love shooting into the light and I love to include the sun when I have the opportunity. So when the sun's higher in the sky, you probably don't want to point a telephoto lens at it for any length of time because a telephoto lens basically acts like a giant magnifier glass and anyone who uh, had a magnifier glass when they were young knows that you could start a fire with it <laughs> if the sun is shining through it. And so if you point your telephoto lens at the sun in the middle of the day for longer than a few seconds, it can actually burn through the sensor and destroy your camera. If you're looking through the viewfinder, it can burn through your eye. So this is a bad idea. But when the sun is low in the horizon, uh, like when it's just touching the horizon in this photograph, it's a lot less intense. So you can safely point your telephoto lens at a scene like this. And you can also look through the viewfinder. You might have some blinkies in your eyes for a few minutes afterwards, uh, but you're not gonna do any permanent damage. So for this photograph of a polar bear, uh, I was shooting at sunset when the sun was going down behind the animal. And it was tough getting the position I needed to keep the sun behind the animal because I was in a boat. So I just basically told the boat captain, keep going back and forth, uh, trying your very best to keep the sun behind the animal. So we really couldn't hold our position. So usually that meant he would drive back and forth. And for a few seconds while the boat was going by, I would have that perfect alignment where I could get a shot with the sun right behind the polar bear. So there was a lot of trial and error, a lot of shots that got thrown out because I couldn't get the shot. But got lucky, managed to get one where the bear is perfectly framed by the setting sun. So this allows me to create, once again, a silhouette artistic expression, but one with a lot of color, one that tells a story about the animal. So it's a more of an artistic expression and less just a documentary record of the scene. If we can go back quick to yes. the female orangutan photo, I have female a female orangutan. About that. Okay. Yep. How did you get the center light on the orangutan? Ah, photo? yes. I forgot to mention. I often, as I said before, I often use some artificial lights. So when working with a lot of subjects in tricky light, I will use flash at low power just to add a little bit of fill illumination. And the reason why I'm using low power. Uh, there's actually several reasons. One, I want to have a natural look. If the flash is too strong, it'll create that artificial flash look. So instead, I want the flash to blend in with the ambient light, just be a little bit brighter than the ambient light so I can uh, help make my subject stand out from the shadows. Also, by keeping the flash at low power, uh, it's less likely that the animal is going to notice the flash, so you're not going to disturb the animal. I found that most animals don't really react to flash anyways uh, because they don't really know what it is. Like an animal like an orangutan, for example, is used to going through the trees and its eyes might be in the shadows for one second and then it passes through some leaves and suddenly it's in the sunlight. So that very quick change in light that you have with a flash is very similar to this, so the animals typically don't react. But when the flash is at low power, uh, they basically don't even notice it. They don't, they don't really see it, perceive it, blink, or react to it. So it's a great way of working with the animal without disturbing them. And that little extra bit of light to fill in the shadows uh, will give your subject just a little bit of extra emphasis in the composition so that the viewer's eye goes to your subject and to not to something else in the photo that happens to be brighter. So thank you, that was a great question. So moving forward, uh, here's a photograph of a cheetah uh, from Kenya, and this cheetah is climbing a tree. So part of this 
uh, getting a shot like this is understanding the behavior of the animal. So from my experience, I know that cheetahs like to climb up trees so they can get a better view of their surroundings and see prey in the distance. And so when I saw a mother and her cubs near this tree, I knew that there was a good chance that one of the cheetahs would climb up it. And as, sure enough, it turns out the cubs were playing on the tree. They were, they were taking turns climbing up the tree and then jumping down. So when the sun started to rise, it was a beautiful sunrise, I selected a position so that I could shoot into the light. And I actually used a wide angle lens here. I was close enough that I could go wide and include a lot of that gorgeous sunrise sky and render the tree in silhouette. So all I needed then was to wait for the moment when one of the cheetahs was on the tree and its silhouette was recognizable so that people looking at it would know that it was a big cat, preferably know that it was a cheetah from the shape. And that was the moment that I triggered the shutter. That was the moment I was waiting for it. So it was a good idea when you're working with backlighting uh, and this trickier, uh, more abstract lighting is you gotta make sure that the animal shape is sufficiently revealed so people know what it is. That's a very important thing. All right, here is a silverback mountain gorilla from the Congo. I went to the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo a few years back. Uh, the situation in the Congo is a little dicey. Uh, every now and then, uh, the safety situation improves enough that they'll open up some of the parks and bring tourism in, but then if the safety situation deteriorates, they'll close the parks for a while until they can restore order. So. Right now, I think uh, some of the parks are open, uh, so it might be worth taking a look going there, but they did have a, a kidnapping um, a few months back of some uh, British tourists, and uh, they had to close the park for a while after that to drive out some of the militia people that were engaged in the criminal behavior. So I, I don't recommend going to the Congo anytime soon, but definitely keep it on your radar screen. But I went there a few years ago to photograph an active volcano and to photograph the mountain gorillas. I've been to photograph the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, Uganda, and the Congo. So I uh, have the triple crown for photographing mountain gorillas in all three countries where they live. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that, though I'm not exactly sure why. The mountain gorilla part is the best <laughs> part of it, not going to all three places. Uh, but uh, for this particular shot, I found this silverback gorilla. Uh, well, I should say my trackers found the silverback gorilla. Uh, it was eating uh, some clay off of this cliff, and the mountain gorillas will do that. They'll eat clay to get some minerals that they need to survive that they don't get from eating plants. And I waited for the moment. I liked the curving shape of the foliage. And I knew that there, that, that shape would really complement the overall composition. So I had to wait for the moment when the gorilla came down and created a shape that worked with the curving shape of the foliage. Now there was a few uh, errant plants sticking up, so I asked one of the rangers to go in with his machete and trim it a little bit so that the shape was better revealed, and he happily obliged. And then the moment came when the gorilla was done feasting on the clay, and uh, he started moving down uh, to get away from that area, and I was lucky he happened to move down exactly where I hoped he would, so he is now nestled it for this shot within that curve that is the basis of the composition. So I'm always thinking about the visual design when I'm making my wildlife photos, which is often why I go a little bit wider, so I can incorporate visual elements from the surrounding landscape into my wildlife compositions. Here's another uh, shot of a lion uh, that was taken once again using artificial light at uh, twilight. And for this particular shot, I went very wide with a 16 millimeter lens because there was this really interesting shape that was emerging from the clouds, or rather there was a gap in the clouds. And to me, it looked like the bat signal in the sky. I was shooting with my friend Zach, who's Canadian, who when I asked him what shape he saw, he said he saw maple leaf. So I guess <laughs> cultural context matters. Uh, but uh, for this shot, I used flash to illuminate the lion. And I got a moment when he uh, was uh, perking up and giving out a little bit of a, of a roar. This time it was really a roar and not a yawn. So I'll just kind of zoom in so you can see. Uh, this is what a roar looks like. <laughs> a yawn the looks yawn more looks exciting. Better, yeah, yeah, the yawn looks a lot better. So just. Get the lion when they're yawning and don't tell anyone that it's a yawn. Tell them it's a mighty roar. <laughs> uh, but the shape in the background in the sky became the basis of my composition. So I went wide enough to use that shape creatively and the lions rendered a little bit smaller as a result, but I think overall it's a more powerful composition. 
uh, because the shape in the sky is so powerful. Now I used flash to illuminate the lion in this particular case instead of a spotlight, but the flash was off camera at an angle uh, being held by the driver of the safari vehicle. So that getting the lens, off, or sorry, getting the flash off camera is a really great way of making the angle of the light look better and making the overall shot look much more pleasing. And uh, all right, here's one of my favorite wildlife photos. Uh, I was trekking in Sumatra looking for orangutans and I took a break on the trail and was sitting down and I look up and this Thomas's leaf monkey had sat down right next to me, which was a rare event because these guys are usually pretty skittish and stay in the trees, but he came down and sat down maybe two or three feet away from me and just was just kind of chilling out. He uh, selected this curving vine as his monkey throne and uh, was holding court. And I think what he probably what happened is he saw me and said, oh yeah, it's another Thomas's leaf monkey. Cause you know, I'm kind of ugly and look like a monkey. In case you didn't get the joke, I'll, I'll explain it to you. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll zoom in, you can kind of see this guy's family got family resemblance. Yeah, he's got my haircut. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are actually really pretty monkeys. There are ugly monkeys and there are pretty monkeys, and I would put this in the pretty monkey category. Uh, so I was lucky to have it for the shot. But because he was so close, I was reaching for my wide angle lens, and I thought, well, maybe this will be more interesting if I use my fisheye lens. And what a fisheye lens does is it makes anything that's straight in the photo look curved. And anything that's curved in the photo ends up looking even more curved. So I really liked the curving shape of the vine. And I knew I wanted to go wide to include that entire shape in the composition. And I figured that the fisheye would enhance that curve and make it look more powerful and compelling. And that's exactly what happened. And I had a little bit of fill flash for this photo as well. Just a very small amount. You can't really even notice it. it. It blends in quite nicely with the ambient light, but it's just a little bit brighter than the ambient light, giving more emphasis to the monkey. So I managed to snap off a few shots of this guy, uh, and then he decided he had had enough of hanging out with me and scampered off to go somewhere else. But it was a really exciting encounter. Uh, it's a shot that I really enjoy, and the only thing that I wish I could have done better is I wish it had been a male orangutan in this shot rather than a monkey, but oh well. You can't always get what you want. It would have been really exciting if it was something like a tiger instead. That would have been awesome. But I probably would not be alive. Probably not. Yeah, so. All right, moving on to the next photo. This is a, a very similar type of shot where I went wide, except instead of being in the rainforest of the Indonesian jungle, this time I was in the highlands of Ethiopia, and I went trekking for a week in the Simeon Mountains, which are these very tall 14,000 foot mountains, and there's this dramatic 7,000 foot escarpment that drops off on one side of the mountain. So it's a really awesome place to go trekking. And I spent several days in the backcountry. And uh, the Simians are famous not only for their beautiful scenery, but for the gelata monkey, which is the only terrestrial ground-dwelling monkey in the world. So these are kind of like the cows of the monkey world. They're, <laughs> they're ground-dwelling grass eaters. Would you consider this the ugly monkey or a pretty monkey category oh, here? Oh, this is definitely a pretty monkey. Okay. So the males in particular uh, are beautiful. They've got these gorgeous golden manes. And they, uh, the other name for this monkey is the bleeding heart monkey. You can see here that they've got this patch on their chest. It looks like they are having open heart surgery. <laughs> so they're called the bleeding heart <laughs> monkey. But these are definitely beautiful monkeys, that golden mane. Uh, you know, I called them the cow of the monkey world, but they really look more like the male lion of the monkey world. <laughs> they've got that same beautiful golden mane that a male lion has. And every evening what happens is the monkeys will roost on the cliffs. So they'll come to the edge of the cliffs and then climb down and sleep hanging from the cliffs to keep away from predators. And then every morning they would come up. So there was a lot of interesting opportunities to photograph the monkeys with dramatic sunrise, sunset, or twilight light. And for this particular scene, I was attracted to the beautiful landscape. I'd started with landscape photographs here at this uh, scenic gorge that's in the mountains. But then the monkeys came down, a troop of about 200 of them, so I switched over to wildlife. And this was shot maybe 15 minutes after the sun had set. There was a lot of dramatic storm clouds in the background. 
And because it was twilight, there was a, a lot of blue light in the scene. So there's this very uh, stormy, moody look to the photograph. I went wide uh, and got as close as the monkey was comfortable with me being. And I used, once again, just a little bit of fill flash at low power to gently illuminate the monkey against that darker background. So the monkey stands out. I used uh, what is known as a snoot, which is a device that you put on your flash and it allows you to control where the light goes so that the light isn't spread out all over the place. I was able to narrow the beam of light, so I was only illuminating the monkey and nothing else around it. That way, it isolates the monkey, and I was able to make it stand out a little bit more powerfully in the composition. So I guess it's fair to say that when you are doing wildlife photography with a flash, it's a good idea to be a little snooty every now and then. Ha-ha. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're just... <laughs> laughing politely at my really bad joke. <laughs> I do think we have a few more uh, photos and techniques to share. Mm -hmm. Here is another example of using artificial light. This is a cheetah uh, from the plains of Kenya. And I had this beautiful sunrise that was happening. And this cheetah got up on a mound, a termite mound, to get a better look at her surroundings. So I had my safari driver select a position with the sun rising right behind the cheetah. And I used just a hint of fill flash to gently illuminate the cheetah against that beautiful sunrise sky. So I didn't want to have it be too bright. Uh, because it would look artificial and obviously flashed. So I kept the exposure relatively low so that it's just revealing some of the detail, but not too much of the detail, giving it that obvious flashed look. And once again, I waited for the moment for the mighty roar. For the yawn. Yeah. The yawn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, back to the rainforest of Sumatra. This is a female orangutan with her infant who was swinging through the trees by me on the trail. And uh, they were relatively close, so I broke out the fisheye again. I love working with the fisheye in the forest because all the trees kind of lean in and they curve in. And that creates these interesting compositional shapes. But the trees also frame my subject nicely. Use just a hint of fill flash to bring out the color, the beautiful orange color of the fur of the orangutan, and to make the animals stand out a bit more from that dark, gloomy rainforest background. So use using that flash to mostly blend in with the ambient light, but just to very subtly alter the balance of light in the wildlife photo. So I, this allows me to let the background go a little bit darker, and oftentimes I'm just intentionally underexposing under the background by a stop or two, so that it, it's going to go darker, the animal is going to be just a little bit relatively brighter, that's going to make it stand out, make it more prominent in the final composition. And I think we have reached the end of my photo presentation. So now we are going to turn it over to you, the viewer. I want to hear your questions. Remember, as always, the funnier the question is, the more likely it'll be read here on air. Put a good joke in there. We love a good joke. <laughs> Before I get into the questions, I just wanted to give another shout out. At the beginning of this live event, I mentioned we were doing a sweepstakes with Tamron. If you missed that, we are currently running a Tamron sweepstakes where you can enter to win one of three lenses. If you win, you get to pick which lens you want. Um, the sweepstakes ends tomorrow, May 15th. So enter either by clicking the little banner below the chat box on the website, or if you're watching on Facebook, click the link in the description and it'll be right there to enter. So without further ado, I'll get into some questions. All right. Let's see, we've got me. a few in here. Give me a hard one. Our first one is from Sherry. I don't know how hard this is, but <laughs> <laughs> how do I balance my ISO and speed with a 600 millimeter lens when shooting birds and wildlife? When I crank up the ISO, the image gets soft. Can you give me some basic settings to start with? Okay, well, I think the first thing, the first variable that you need to set is your shutter speed. And you will set a shutter speed that will allow you to freeze the action in the scene. So there's going to be two potential sources of movement in the scene. It can be the animal itself, uh, or it can be the lens. And if you're hand holding the lens, there might be a lot of vibration and movement because none of us can hold uh, the lens is steady as a tripod can. So if you're hand holding, you're going to want to have a minimum shutter speed to ensure that you capture your subject 
uh, sharply. And the old rule of thumb is that you take your focal length and then you invert it and you choose a shutter speed that corresponds. So if you're shooting with a 600 millimeter lens and you're hand holding, you probably want to have about 1 500th of a second at a minimum to get a sharp image. Now, most lenses will give you an option for image stabilization. And this will allow you to get sharp images with a slower shutter speed when you're hand holding. So instead of 1 500th of a second, you might be able to get away with 1 250th of a second. It's worth experimenting with your lens. Uh, it really depends on how steady your hands are uh, and how good the image stabilization system in the lens or the camera is. Uh, but usually you can get away with uh, at least a stop, maybe two less than the rule of thumb inverse formula that I gave you. So if you're shooting with a 500 millimeter lens and typically 1 500th of a second is what you'd need, chances are 1 250th of a second will be okay. You might even be able to get away with 1 1 25th of a second. But uh, I always err on the side of caution when you're, especially with working with heavier, longer lenses because they just tend to move around in your hands more. It's harder to hold them steady. Uh, the other variable for shutter speed is subject speed. So if you're shooting birds in flight, you might need a faster shutter speed other than that minimum shutter speed that I talked about earlier for hand holding. So if the bird is on a perch and standing relatively still, 1 500th of a second is probably going to be okay. But if it's a bird in flight, you might need 1 1,000th of a second. If it's moving very fast, 1 2 thousandth of a second. So it really depends on how fast the animal's moving. But usually, usually for most bird in flight shots, one one thousandth of a second is more than enough to freeze the action. Probably one five hundredth of a second is good enough for most uh, birds that are in flight. So somewhere in that range, you're probably okay. Now, that's the shutter speed that you've chosen. The next thing you need to do is choose an ISO. And you can't just choose it in the abstract. It's going to depend on how much light there is. If there's a lot of light, if things are really bright, you're not going to need to use a higher ISO to get those uh, faster shutter speeds. But if it's relatively dark, you may need to use those higher ISOs to get those fast shutter speeds. So you can't just uh, select these in isolation. All of these variables, uh, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, are dependent on the existing light. So if you've got more light, you can avoid the higher ISOs. But if you've got a lot of light, or if you don't have much light, you're going to have to use the higher ISOs to get that fast shutter speed. So the shutter speed is the important variable. The ISO is the secondary variable. Usually when I'm shooting wildlife, when the shutter speed is the most important variable, I will switch over to shutter priority mode on my camera. So that allows me to set the shutter speed that I think is what I need to capture a sharp image. And then I also turn on auto ISO. So then my camera will pick an ISO that will allow me to get that shutter speed. So I'm not even thinking about ISO. I do pay attention to what's happening to my ISO when things get really dark. And if I start seeing my ISO creep up too high, I might make a compromise. I might select a slower shutter speed to keep my ISO from going higher. I'm always checking to see what aperture is being set as well. Uh, more often than not, I'm looking to shoot with a wide open aperture so I can blur out that background. But you know, the, the, how high of an ISO you can use is going to depend on what your camera can handle with high ISO. Some cameras handle high ISOs much better than others. So, you know, for me, I know that a lot of the times with the cameras I'm using, I can get away with shooting ISO 3200 and still get a sharp uh, file that doesn't have too much digital noise. But other cameras, you might have to avoid ISOs above 800 or 1600 or even above 400, depending on how your camera handles ISO, high ISO noise. So set that shutter speed first, and then set an ISO uh, that will allow you to keep that shutter speed and work with the existing light. All right. I heard you talking a little bit about how you hold your camera and balancing it. So this question mm -hmm. is related to that. I'm not sure if you answered it or not. But Jade asks, are most of the wildlife photos you've taken using a tripod, tripod or handheld? So I believe in stabilizing your equipment whenever you can. So when I'm working with subjects where I can use a tripod, I will use a tripod because that'll give you the most stable platform. Uh, you're still going to be moving around uh, because you're probably not going to be locking down the head that's on the tripod that the camera is attached to. Uh, you're going to have a, a movement uh, so that you can move with the subject if the subject's moving around. So there still is some vibration that's introduced. But over 
overall, it's the, the stablest platform you can have. Uh, now, with a lot of my subjects, like when I'm on safari in Africa, I can't set up a tripod because I'm in a safari vehicle. So in cases like that, usually I'm using a bean bag support, which is just a big bag that you fill with beans or rice, and um, you throw it over the side of the vehicle, like the window if you're shooting out the window or on the top of the vehicle. And that gives you a very stable platform and allows you also freedom of movement. So a bean bag is a great way. Uh, just a little trick, when you're traveling with a bean bag, usually a good idea to take the beans or the rice out when you're flying because otherwise you've got 15 pounds worth yeah, of stuff. Expertise. And then just buy beans or rice when you're on location. Just make sure that you can find a place where you can buy beans and rice. Though usually, pretty much everywhere around the world, you can find beans or rice. Uh, <laughs> a lot of my photos are done handheld, though. For example, when I'm in the rainforest trekking with orang orangutans or when I'm trekking with gorillas, there's really no way to set up a tripod or no easy way. The animals are moving around too fast. They're usually up in the trees. You're working in uneven ground. So hand-holding is your only option. So I do a fair amount, I would say probably 30% tripod, 30% beanbag, 30% handheld. But if I can find a way to support my lens, I will, because overall you're gonna find that you get much sharper photos. All right, uh, our next question is from Charlotte who asks, what's the most difficult animal you photographed? Ah, Charlotte, that is a fantastic question. I will take a moment to ponder this. To think about hmm. it. Uh, so, uh, you know, animal, all the animals have uh, their particular challenges. You know, when you're photographing uh, the big cats in Africa, there's always the risk that you'll get eaten, uh, which <laughs> makes things more exciting. Actually, it's very safe. You're inside a safari vehicle <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> and the lions, they don't think of uh, uh, lunch when they see the safari vehicles. They just think they're seeing some, like, big, weird hippo, and they just <laughs> ignore you. Uh, you know, same thing with the polar bears. The polar bears were very challenging. When I go to photograph them, I usually go up to the Arctic in Alaska, uh, and there uh, you're photographing the animals from a boat. So the North Sea, the Arctic Sea, is often quite choppy. So uh, even when you're in a protected bay, the boat can be moving up and down quite a bit, which makes uh, getting, uh, tracking your subject uh, and getting a sharp image very challenging. Um, I would say, though, let me think about this for a moment. Probably the most, some of the most challenging subjects are the, the most innocuous ones. You know, you can go and get a photograph of something exciting like a tiger or a lion, and even if it's not a very good photo, people are still going to be really super impressed by the fact yeah. because the animal is so cool. I, I like working with some of the the more obscure animals or the animals that are less exciting. And the challenge there is more artistic. So, you know, for example, when I photographed that Thomas's leaf monkey, yeah. uh, those are animals that are far less exciting than the Sumatran tiger or the Sumatran orangutan. Uh, but uh, by using composition and light creatively, you can photograph these uh, quote unquote boring animals and make them look exciting to people. All right, good answer. Our next question is from Facebook. And speaking of Facebook, I thought I'd give a little shout out here. Make sure you're following Outdoor Photography Guide on Facebook, Instagram, we're on Pinterest, we're on YouTube, Twitter, just so you know what we're up to. We do different things on each channel, so it's still worth your while to follow all of them. So give our social media handles a check out there. But from Facebook, we have a question from John who asks, how do you prevent stressing out the wildlife that you're photographing? Do you have set standards when you're doing a shoot? Uh, so uh, that's, that's a great question, and it's something that I'm always thinking about when I'm photographing wildlife. And there are some standards that have been published by various wildlife photography organizations, and you certainly can check those out if you want. You know, for me, generally, I just apply what I consider to be the golden rule of, of wildlife photography, which is, uh, don't do anything to the animal that you wouldn't want the animal doing to you. <laughs> so as a general matter, I, I just avoid trying, you know, I don't want to do anything that's going to stress out the animal or make it uncomfortable. And on the other hand, if the animal seems fine with what I'm doing, then I don't have a problem uh, with doing it. So I really leave it up to the animal. Uh, there's a few ways you can stress out an animal when you're doing wildlife photography. You can get too close, uh, and usually the animal will let you know by pretty simply moving away. So uh, when you're in a situation like that, 
you know, it might be okay. You try to get a little bit closer, it moves a little bit away. You might try it one more time, maybe slowing down and, and you know, crouching down to get lower. But if you find yourself in a pattern of you moving closer, the animal moving away, you're stressing out the animal, you definitely should stop doing that. Uh, so that's something that I avoid. If, if uh, the animal seems comfortable and I, I try to approach slowly and incrementally, uh, I'll often, you know, keep my eyes lowered so I'm not challenging the animal. Uh, a lot of prey animals are threatened by eye contact because that's what they associate with predators. And a lot of predator animals are very territorial uh, and they perceive eye challenge as a, as a threat. So as a general matter, I, I try to keep my eyes low. Sometimes I'll talk in a friendly, soothing voice to the animal, just let him know that I'm his friend. Uh, I don't know if that works or not. <laughs> it makes you feel better. Yeah. yeah. but. You know, as I said, I let the animal dictate. If I, if I sense that I'm, I'm getting too close and it's making the animal uncomfortable, I just back off. It's not worth getting the shot. Same thing when I'm working with flash. Uh, I, you know, as I said, I keep it at low power. I have never really encountered a situation where an animal has reacted to me using the flash. I know that 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 certainly can happen. And I think there's certain circumstances where you just avoid using flash altogether. So like nocturnal animals that have eyesight that's adapted to the dark, like owls, for example, you probably don't want to flash them because you know at night it's going to disorient them uh, and it could cause some uh, you know, permanent damage if they fly into a tree or something like that because they can't see anything. So you, you definitely want to be cognizant of those specific situations where you know flash will be bad. And then there's another category of situations where flash might be a problem. So for example, with some species that are adapted to both day and night, like a lion, lions see perfectly in the day, they also hunt at night. So if you're photographing at twilight, uh, you know, you know that, that as the light gets darker, the cat's eyes are opening wider, the pupils are opening wider and wider, a uh, strong burst of flash could temporarily annoy the animal and disorient it. So that, in situations like that, I almost always am lowering my flash power so that the animal won't be bothered by it or I'm switching over to a softer form of light like a spotlight or something like that at low power. So I am always thinking about uh, how my presence can cause the animals to react. And if I sense that the animal's uncomfortable, I back off. But if I sense that the animal is okay with what I'm doing, uh, I will continue to do what I'm doing, but always being fully aware uh, that the animal's comfort can change at any moment, so I'm ready to back off right away if I need to. All right, that kind of segues into our next question here, because you talked about night photography mm -hmm. a lot here. And you have a few photos where I think the safari vehicle is showing a light on the animals. Yes. But we have a question asked from Will who asks, how do you capture wildlife at night in near pitch black darkness? So maybe you don't have yeah. a light to shine on them, or you don't want to flash the animal if it's a nocturnal one. Well, if, if you don't have any light, then you, you really can't <laughs> take the photo. Maybe you shouldn't be taking a photo, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just kind of impossible. And you know, some of the photos that I showed were actually taken in the early part of twilight when it's actually very bright out to the eye, but by selecting uh, an exposure that intentionally underexposes the photo, it looks a lot darker than it really is. But if it's dark out, uh, and you're not using any source of light, it's gonna be very difficult to get a photo of the animal because your camera needs light to operate, to capture something. Um, and you know, let's say the, the moon is out, there might be a fair amount of light out there, but you'd have to be using an incredibly high ISO to capture something with moonlight on it. And I think it probably would, you could do that, but you'd still end up with a pretty long exposure. So I think it's pretty impossible. There, there might be some ways of using night vision technology with a camera. I've, I've kind of been curious about that. I d haven't really tried it, so I don't know if it's possible. I mean, I know that there are night vision cameras out there, but I think they're very specialized. They have low megapixel counts, uh, and, and you're not really gonna get a high quality photograph out of a situation like that. But you just absolutely need light to make a photograph at night. It's just impossible to shoot if you don't have enough light. All right, since a lot of your photos are on safari here, we have someone, uh, James, who's mm -hmm. going on safari in a couple of months. All right, asks, great. What would be useful to know before shooting? Can you please provide me with any advice you've learned from the experience? Maybe something you wouldn't necessarily think of right away. Well, I, you know, I guess it depends on where you're going on safari, but one thing you want probably to know ahead of time is what kind of safari vehicle you have. There are basically two kinds. Uh, there are the kinds that just have windows that open up, and then there's the a safari vehicle where you could pop up and and shoot from the top of the vehicle. Oh. And 
I generally prefer shooting lower down because the lower you get, the more you can get that direct eye contact, the more you can get uh, some of the background, the sky in the background behind the animal. When you're up higher, you're often pointing down, so you've got ground behind the animal. But sometimes you need to be higher up to even see the animals, and if the animals are farther away, the higher up perspective is probably just as good as the lower down perspective. But all things being equal, I'd prefer to have a, a safari vehicle that offers both options. If I had to choose one, I would choose the lower angled option. Also, you're going to want to know how many people are in the safari vehicle uh, because it's better if there's less people. It's better if all the people in the vehicle are photographers. And it's better to have a whole row to yourself so that you can shoot either left or right side of the vehicle as opposed to having someone on your left or your right so that if the, if the animal is on one side, only one side of the vehicle can get a photo of it. You want to avoid that sort of situation. So these are the things I'm thinking about when I'm planning a safari. Adventure. I know when I led photo tours in Africa in the past, I would uh, try to set it up so that the people in the safari vehicle would be able to shoot both left and right side if they had to. So that's a key consideration. And also find out if uh, the guide is going to supply bean bags or not. Uh, a lot of the photo safari guides there know that the photographers want the support, so they'll have bean bags. So that way you don't have to travel with your own. And you don't have to worry about finding beans when you <laughs> arrive on location. Don't have to look for beans or rice while you're <laughs> out there. Um, our next question is from Eva, who asks, are all of your animal photos truly wild subjects, or do you go, in, go, go to any refugees or parks where the animals are maybe more domesticated? Uh, the vast majority of my wildlife subjects are truly wild subjects. Uh, the only caveat to that would be when I photograph the orangutans. Uh, this, these are all truly wild orangutans, but some of the orangutans in this area are rehabilitated animals that have been re-released in the wild, so they're a bit more habituated to, uh, to people. So when I'm out there, it's usually a mix of wild animals and animals that were rehabilitated. They're all wild animals, but obviously the rehabilitated ones are a bit more comfortable around people. So it's just a mix. But no, I'm, I'm typically not photographing in controlled situations. Uh, I you know, typically don't go to, to zoos or to game uh, parks where the wildlife is domesticated and managed. Uh, nothing, not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with that, but I, I prefer photographing wild animals. Of course, uh, there are various levels of familiarity that animals might have with people. You know, you, if you go to a, a place, uh, let's say you go to a local preserve that has a boardwalk through the marsh, you know that the birds there might be really habituated to people and might not be concerned as people are walking by the boardwalk. But if you're out exploring you know, the marsh by kayak in a place where people never go, the birds are probably going to be a lot more skittish there. So uh, even wild animals can end up being fairly habituated to people in places. All right. Our next question from No Name, just a guess it says in here. <laughs> what do you find more beneficial in wildlife photography, shutter speed or aperture? Okay, so this is a question that comes up a lot. And on the one hand, uh, most of the time when you're shooting wildlife, you probably want to shoot with a wide open aperture uh, because you want to blur that background out. You don't want to have a distracting background. And if the background's in focus behind the animal, that's likely to to uh, distract from your subject. So having that shooting wide open with the biggest aperture you have will increase the likelihood that the background will be blurred out and just be a pleasing wash of color behind the animal that doesn't distract from your main subject. On the other hand, shutter speed is also very important because almost always when you're photographing wildlife, you need to have a minimum shutter speed to make sure that you're getting sharp images, either because you're hand holding or even if you're on a tripod or on a bean bag, you're still moving around. So you need to be able to capture, uh, you know, you need to have a minimum shutter speed to ensure that you got sharp images. And if your subject's moving around, you might need to have an even higher shutter speed. So usually, I'm actually shooting in shutter priority because I know more than anything that that is what I want to have to make sure I get sharp images. Now, also when I'm shooting wildlife, I'm typically shooting in lower light situations, twilight, sunrise, and sunset. I'm not really doing a lot of shooting in the middle of the day. So I know that in those low light situations when I'm shooting in shutter priority, that almost always I'm going to end up with my widest aperture to let in the maximum amount of light. The only time that shutter priority might result in uh, smaller apertures that you want to avoid 
is if you're shooting in the middle of the day when things are brighter. So it's something that I personally don't worry about. You can also, with a lot of cameras, you can shoot in manual mode, so you can set your aperture and your shutter speed, and then uh, link that with auto ISO. I'm a, I'm a big fan of auto ISO with wildlife because lighting conditions are often rapidly changing, and I don't even want to think about the ISO. I want to be thinking about the important variables, shutter speed, uh, sometimes aperture, I don't want to be thinking about constantly changing my ISO if conditions are changing rapidly. So I let my camera change the ISO. The only thing I'm worried about is setting the shutter speed and then uh, looking at the resulting exposure that my camera's picking, I might use exposure compensation to adjust the exposure as necessary to make sure it's sufficiently bright or, or uh, you know, not too dark. Um, and uh, then I let the camera just you know, float with the ISO as necessary. If I'm in really low light, I'll start paying attention to what ISO my camera's choosing, because if I you know, look down and realize that my camera's choosing an ISO of 20,000, then I know if I really want to get a good shot, a clean shot without too much digital noise, I'm going to have to compromise somewhere else, usually use a slower shutter speed than I might otherwise use to get that ISO down. But uh, I am a big fan of using the auto ISO. It works great. Uh, you never have to think about the ISO. You never have to be worried, oh, hey, the light just changed. Did I totally screw up that great shot of the lion jumping uh, in the air with the rainbow behind it because I forgot to reset my ISO when the light changed? No, nope, <laughs> don't have to worry about it. I got the shot. I know I did because I used auto ISO. All right, our next question is a snoot-related question. All right, so, a snooty and, question, yep. yes. Um, in reference to your spot flash technique, yep. um, does exposure vary based on how widely the snoot is, or how wide the snoot is? Um, so let's see, that's, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I technically know the answer. So obviously the snoot is designed to narrow the beam of light coming out from the flash, and so the uh, camera, when it's metering, uh, will be metering off the light that is uh, hitting the scene from the flash. So as you narrow the beam of light, uh, that's reducing the amount of the flash light that's hitting the scene. So it could uh, interfere if you're working in an auto exposure mode uh, because so the, the camera is going to set a flash exposure based on the feedback it's getting when the flash fires it's going to be reading the light hitting the scene, and then it's going to stop firing the flash um, uh, when, it, when it hits the appropriate amount of light. So that's, you have, that's what flash compensation does. You can use flash compensation to reduce or increase the output of flash. So when you're using flash compensation, the amount of light that's actually hitting the subject probably is an important variable there. So I'm guessing that when you're using a snoot, it's reducing the amount of flash hitting the subject. It might make it... Uh, the camera might be reading that flashlight a little bit, little bit differently. Uh, but I think the key thing to remember is whenever you're using an auto exposure mode on your camera or you're using the auto exposure mode like the through the lens exposure mode with flash on your camera, that you should take a test shot, see what the result is, both in terms of the ambient light captured by the camera and what the flashlight looks like. And then you can adjust exposure compensation on your camera or flash compensation on your flash to better balance the light the way you want it to be. And that's the critical thing, is to always be taking test exposures and checking the way things look and making intelligent decisions about the amount of compensation you need to apply to make it look right. All right, it's time for our last question. Last We're question. We're out of time, but before our last question, I just wanted to give one more reminder <laughs> for you to enter our Tamron sweepstakes so you could win one of three Tamron lenses because it ends tomorrow. Tomorrow's the last day for you to enter our Tamron sweepstakes. You can click the link in the banner below the chat box on the OPG website, or you can click the link in the description on our Facebook if you're watching. And remember, Facebook. there's nothing better than free glass. Free things. Yes. Who doesn't love free things? So <laughs> just enter and you could win something for free. Our next question is from Corey. Our last question okay. is from Corey. Final question. Who asks, do you ever use an external light meter for your wild, wildlife shots if you have the chance or rely on in-camera metering for quick adjustments of light? Did that, we just cover this? No, or no, we this, did not. Okay. This, is, this, is, this is actually an interesting question. I get these questions about external light meters a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is, 
For the vast majority of outdoor photography, you never ever want to bother with an external light meter. An external light meter, I think, is useful in controlled situations. Usually, uh, an external light meter requires you to hold the meter in front of your subject to get a reading. So you can do this with wildlife if you're comfortable with walking right up to a hungry lion. But my recommendation is probably not worth it. Uh, using the camera metering system is the best way to go. There are uh, spot meters, but those are not really going to allow you to get a reading for the flash. An external flash meter would require you to hold the meter in front of the subject. There might be a few, I mean, I'm not a studio shooter, so there might be other types of meters out there uh, that I'm not aware of. But for the most part, you're never going to need an external light meter, and it's probably something that you really can't pragmatically use in the field because you can't get close enough to your wildlife subject to use it. So the in-camera uh, metering systems for both the camera and the flash are going to be your best bet. As I said before, just make sure you're making an intelligent decision. Take some test shots and adjust flash compensation or exposure compensation on your camera as necessary to balance the light properly and to get the scene to look the right way to make sure that the histogram is properly exposed so that you're not clipping any of your highlights or losing detail that's critical in your shadows. So always make intelligent decisions. When I'm shooting wildlife, I've disciplined myself, even if I'm in the moment, to take a break uh, every now and then, pull up a shot that I've just taken on my LCD screen, and double check to make sure that the exposure is where I want it to be. Because if the light is changing while you're photographing something, uh, you could find that you need to adjust your exposure using exposure compensation. If you don't, you're getting the wrong results. So even if you've got two polar bears jumping up in the air and fighting with a lightning storm behind them, uh, make sure that every 20 or 30 shots, you just take a quick moment to make sure that everything is spot on with exposure and keep going. You might miss that one or two shots, but it's better, better than having like 40 or 50 shots of something amazing that are completely useless because you have the wrong exposure. All right, that was right. the last question. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your great questions. We had some really good questions this time, but not a lot of funny questions. <laughs> so please work on that for the next exciting episode next month of OPG Live. Thanks for joining. I'm Ian Plant. I'm Lilia Khalif. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.